Hello, this is Micah Long, and today I'll be taking my Thinking Simple series to review ECMO in a very basic approach to how you look at ECMO and how you deal with common problems on an ECMO circuit. ECMO can really be thought of just as the blood going round and round with a little stop in the middle. Again, I'm Micah, I'm one of the critical care anesthesiologists, and I will be putting this talk on my YouTube channel, theicudad.com. ECMO is really a simple setup. It is made of three main components. It has a pump that pushes the blood out and pulls the blood in. It has an oxygenator, which is the fanciest and most unique part of the setup. That oxygenator both clears CO2 and adds oxygen. And it has a warmer, or a cooler for that matter. The pump itself is a non-pulsatile centrifugal pump that runs around 2,000 to 6,000 RPM. As you turn the RPM up, it lyses more blood cells, so you don't want to do that too often. And it follows the normal centrifugal pump principles, shown on the bottom here, where it sucks blood into the middle and the rotor spins fast and fast, pushing blood out the side of the pump and along its way. The flow through the pump is related both to the RPM that you set, as well as to what blood you deliver to it, the preload, and how much pressure the blood is after it, the afterload. Preload in these pumps is really important because they spin at a constant RPM no matter what is going around, uh, going on around them. And that means that if you are bleeding out and have very little blood, or if you occlude the tubing before the pump, the pump will keep spinning at a set RPM and it will start to suck in to the plastics itself, as in it pulls so hard it sucks the uh, tubes together, kind of like a straw or balloon that's running empty. And that can make the tubing shake. And in ECMO lingo, this is called chugging. It's where the tubes are shaking on the bed. And it reflects a state where the preload of the pump is very low. And it sometimes refers to the preload of the patient. They don't have much blood to give. And it sometimes refers to anatomical or equipment problems, like the tubing is kinked or the tube is positioned in the patient against a lumen or the wall of a blood vessel incorrectly. The second part of the ECMO circuit is the oxygenator. The oxygenator has this blender that simply delivers a set amount of oxygen and air and it does that at a set sweep rate. And sweep just refers to the airflow through the device. You can deliver different amounts of oxygen in that airflow, anywhere from room air to 100% FiO2. And it runs in a um, concurrent way to the blood flow through the oxygenator itself. The oxygen diffuses from the ECMO oxygenator into the blood. And it does that fairly slowly because oxygen is a bigger molecule. It takes time to pass over the membrane. It's slightly charged. And so the oxygen diffuses in slowly in a way that's dependent on blood flow and the FiO2 or the concentration gradient over that membrane. And the oxygen, of course, also relies on a functioning membrane to diffuse adequately. So you can't have clots all over your membrane. The CO2 then diffuses out from the blood into the circuit or into the ECMO air part, the oxygenator. And that diffuses out really quickly. CO2 actually collapses on itself, is not charged, and is a very small molecule. And so CO2 is less dependent on the circuit membrane. It's less dependent on blood flow. It's efficient almost immediately as blood goes across. And it escalates dramatically for each amount of airflow you um, escalate. So a sweep speed of one to a sweep speed of three increases the CO2 clearance in a very linear way. This is a picture of a clotting out membrane on an oxygenator where there's lots of clots all over it and then they flushed it through with saline. And what you can see here is that these clots that occur on the membrane are actually visible. They're a lot harder to see when you're looking and it's filled with blood and there's little clot clots on it, but they look like little tails or little solid bits within the oxygenator itself. This is another picture of the blender, um, which is more simple than you'd think it'd be. Frequently it's just those little 
flow meters that you would adjust a nasal cannula from, except it's going to the ECMO circuit, which always felt very discordant to me. Then again, you turn up the sweep from 0 to 15 liters of airflow. Normally, it's matched to how much blood flow you have. And the picture of the oxygenator is on bottom there with some of the parts labeled oxygen diffusing in in a blood flow and FiO2 dependent way and CO2 diffusing out very quickly related to the sweep. ECMO also involves a lot of plastics and these plastics are big tubes and they result in a lot of blood outside of the body. Now of course this isn't cardiac bypass where you have a whole tub of blood out of the body but it's blood outside the body which in general is not the best thing for you and it results in an inflammatory and abnormal coagulation process that is a result of blood being out of the body and going through the pump and going through a whole lot of plastics. Now plastics and ECMO and the different types of PVC tubing is an entire talk within itself and I won't be going through it today. However, it's an important one and understand that uh, if it's something you want to make a career out of, it's pretty important to understand these sorts of things. ECMO also involves a warmer, and it's really a warmer and cooler. You can cool people on it. And what that means is you have no real idea what the patient's endogenous temperature is. If they're febrile, they'll be cooled to normal. If they're cold, they'll be warmed to normal. So it takes their temperature and makes it one less thing you can look at in a meaningful way to determine if they have an infection or if they're adrenally insufficient. And finally, a lot of the other equipment on the ECMO circuit is the monitors, the battery, a backup pump, a backup pump that is uh, um, able to be cranked manually and things like that. There are many monitors that show up on the screens. Just remember that they're not always calibrated and so they're not always accurate. However, the screen is quite simple in terms of its adjustments. There's an increase RPM and decrease RPM and it uses a flow meter to tell you what speed you get for a given RPM. Basic ECMO can be used in two core ways that are important to understand. The first is veno-venous. Veno, the first part being where you draw blood from, and venous, where you give back the blood. So veno-venous ECMO pulls blood from the veins, typically femoral vein here, runs through the ECMO circuit, and in the case of veno-venous ECMO, while you use the pump, the most important part of the ECMO circuit is the oxygenator where you're going to clear up. CO2 and add oxygen and then deliver it back to the venous side. In this case it's shown as the IJ. And the blood then following that area will be a mix of the ECMO blood and whatever blood is left over. So if you have an ECMO flow of 4 but the native cardiac output is 8, you'll have a mix of 50% ECMO blood and 50% venous blood. Veno-arterial ECMO, on the other hand, is utilized when the heart is not working. Here we pull blood from the venous side again, what's shown as a femoral vein drawing blood, and we administer blood into a, a major artery, in this case shown as femoral artery. And in this situation, the blood flow then goes down the femoral artery as well as back up the femoral artery to the vena cava and then to the heart and to the head and to the other core vessels above the ECMO cannula. Now when you're doing veno-arterial ECMO, you are focusing ECMO use or ECMO on the pump part of the ECMO. And you can get one to six liters a minute. And we generally use the oxygenator because if you don't, you're pumping in venous blood down the aorta, which is suboptimal, of course. But the core part or feature of the ECMO that you're interested in is the pump. All right, let's do some cases. The first case is the first patient that, as a fellow, I called the ECMO team to cannulate. But it didn't start out that way. This is a 30-year-old young man that was a rigorous individual, was doing a lot of camping, very active, strong, and no past medical, who developed a blasto pneumonia and developed ARDS. As a consequence to the ARDS, he required intubation and mechanical ventilation, and his P to F ratio was horrifying. We had done adequate PEEP. We trialed recruitments. We used prone positioning, and he was reverse cycling, and so we did paralysis. 
A ventilator had a plateau pressure of 35, a peep of 18, driving pressure of 20. And our uh, heart rate was elevated, MAP was elevated, his SAT was very low. Lab showed a moderate respiratory acidosis, and the question came up of whether we should consider ECMO or whether we should optimize his current supportive care. And this is a great question because it gets at the idea of why we ECMO. One of the core things to know before we think about ECMO is what we do before we ECMO. Because you don't simply want to say, oh, the SAT is low, it's been low a while, we should put him on ECMO. You want to make sure you've done all the right stuff first. And so the things I want to review briefly are how we ventilate a patient in ARDS, the supportive care options, ECMO in ARDS and some of the history there, and then get at the idea of hypoxia and whether we use ECMO for hypoxia or whether we use it for something else. Of course, ARDS supportive care is many grand rounds in and of itself, but if you're involved in the decision-making process of ECMO or not, you need to make sure you have a checklist in your head to be confident that the physicians caring for the patient have provided optimal supportive care before you escalate to the level of extracorporeal support. Traditionally, ARDS has uh, um, encompasses a mixed series of diagnoses and of course treating the underlying cause of the ARDS is one of the most important things to think about and be sure of before you jump to ECMO. And once you are in the ARDS window you assume the underlying conditions being treated and the way you care for somebody is to make sure you're not harming them with a ventilator. And the way we do that is by minimizing our driving pressure of the ventilator, and we do that by providing lower tidal volumes per the distant ARMA trial, which looked at conservative tidal volumes, very low, that resulted in respiratory acidosis and even a little bit more hypoxia, but dramatically improved mortality compared to big tidal volumes. More recent work has suggested that the tidal volume itself is not what actually matters, and what makes an actual difference in the patient outcome is the driving pressure. And the driving pressure of a ventilator is a marker of how much energy the vent is delivering to the lung. It's simply the delta P of the vent delivered pressure minus the PEEP to give a breath. So if the total high airway pressure at the top of a breath delivered is 30, and the PEEP is 10, you have a driving pressure of 20. The vent increases the pressure by 20 to deliver the tidal volume that you've selected. Of course, if you're not compliant, to get that same tidal volume needs a much higher delta P. And so the driving pressure is to some degree something we pick. You can decrease it simply by decreasing tidal volume and stretching the lung less but it's also a marker of how sick a patient is in that the sicker and less compliant your lung is, the more driving pressure it takes to get a given tidal volume. And overlying this, we want to make sure we have adequate PEEP. And adequate PEEP is another topic that could be an entire Grand Rounds presentation, but I'll simply say that a good intensivist should have a rough idea of adequate PEEP. And for a typical ARDS patient, an adequate PEEP is on average somewhere between 10 and 15. Recruitment measures has a host of pro and con literature, but they can be considered and useful in an occasional patient. The figure on the right is from a fairly recent publication put out in the New England Journal of Medicine that is really considered the landmark trial looking at driving pressure and whether the tidal volume is most important or the driving pressure is most important and whether the plateau pressure is what hurts people, the, the total lung distending pressure, or whether it's this driving pressure. And what they did is they grouped patients statistically into groups that had matched PEEP, but escalating driving pressure, that's the left one, and then a group that had a matched driving pressure, but escalating PEEP, that's the middle one, and then they statistically categorized people in the 
right column with a matched plateau pressure but escalating peak. And what they found was that in the middle, the driving pressure had no difference in mortality among a broad range of PEEP samples. And so the adjusting from high to low PEEP didn't change the relative risk of death in the group that had the same driving pressure. On the left, they had a matched PEEP and an escalating driving pressure. And you can see that as the driving pressure went up and up and up, so did the mortality. And this is a strong indication that a higher plat uh, driving pressure is worse for your patient. And finally, in the far right column, the groups had a matched plateau pressure. Um, and as the PEEP went up, uh, the mortality went down. But as the PEEP goes up, the delta P goes down. And so this is another way to look at the um, outcome as the driving pressure decreases. But on the bottom of the figure they wrote some really useful things and one is simply that higher PEEP isn't really protective. It's only protective if the driving pressure decreases. And so you want to be using PEEP to your advantage where it improves the compliance of the lung and not more. And finally in the two leftmost uh, columns you see that the higher plateau pressure isn't necessarily what matters, it's simply the driving pressure. And so a low driving pressure with a ton of PEEP, because you need that PEEP, is perfectly safe even if the plateau pressure is high. Finally, there's a host of other supportive care measures we use in ARDS. We of course treat the underlying condition. We put people on their bellies and do adult tummy time called prone positioning. We use steroids. Most people agree with this, but not all pulmonologists agree that steroids should be used, and there's some patients that can be harmed from it. Vitamin C is an evolving area of debate, but the only multicenter, multinational, randomized controlled trial showed a mortality benefit in vitamin C use for ARDS that occurred after sepsis. An old, old study that looked at SWAN catheter use and CVP-guided therapy in ARDS suggests that mortality gets better if you have a lower CVP, so we try to minimize fluid and pulmonary edema. Paralysis um, is a big topic. It was suggested to be beneficial, and then a more recent randomized trial showed that that wasn't the case, but certainly there are occasional times where paralysis is indicated, such as synchrony problems where you have dangerous dyssynchronies like reverse cycling. And you can view my lecture on ventilator synchrony to go through those. And finally, there's occasional patients that benefit from other unique measures like inhaled nitric or epoprostenol or APRV ventilation. This is my moment where I can make sure that people know that you can easily Google how to ventilate a patient with ARDS and that can be intensely helpful at night when you're tired and you don't want to read primary literature. And this is the ARDSNET vent card. It's an old one, but it's actually quite a reasonable one, and ventilator management hasn't changed drastically, although we really do focus more on driving pressure than the plateau pressure that's focused here. But if you use this vent card, you're in a very good starting place. This reviews the oxygenation goals, a low PEEP strategy, a high PEEP strategy, and how you deal with elevated plateau pressures. In the case of this ARDSNET vent card with a high plateau pressure, you just decrease the tidal volume. And this again suggests the, the uh, injury to the lung can be fixed by delivering smaller tidal volumes which will result in a lower driving pressure. As opposed to mechanical ventilation, when we're thinking about ECMO, we really should be at least moderately familiar with some of the literature about it. Most ECMO literature is retrospective in nature and suffers intensely from patient selection bias because patients going on ECMO have been refractory to medical therapies and it's very challenging to uh, compare groups because the same patient physiology, bad lungs, bad pH, bad RV function, ARDS, will be handled very differently in a 
um, 75 or 80 year old person as opposed to a 30 year old person. The two core landmark studies looking at ECMO use in ARDS are the CSER trial, which is a massively problematic trial that basically says that you should go to a major center if you have severe ARDS, and the EOLIA trial, which was a well done study published not that long ago in the New England Journal of Medicine that compared management of patients with severe ARDS, defined as having a PDF ratio under 50 for over three hours, a PDF ratio of under 80 for over six hours, or a severe respiratory acidosis for over six hours. And they took that group and compared placement on ECMO at that time, so when they hit those three and six hour marks, compared to standard of care being supportive care like protective ventilation, proning, and the like. Their primary outcome was mortality at 60 days. I was very disappointed at this as their only outcome because one of the reasons we put people on ECMO is to do lung protective lung rest on ECMO and not pound them with a ventilator. And I think there might be some longitudinal benefit towards your lung recovery, but they didn't really look at that. However, their primary outcome measure was not statistically significant between the groups, although certainly it was close to it with a P of 0.07, and there was a trend towards improvement in mortality with ECMO. Now, one of the most notable struggles with interpreting this trial is that there was a massive crossover rate to ECMO. It was 28% in the standard of care group uh, of those, 28% of those patients became ECMO patients, and in that group, they had a 57% mortality, higher, but assuming that they had a refractory injury. Um, and I'm curious if this group may have benefited from earlier ECMO. However, this was a not defining trial in the sense that it was not statistically significant um, and it didn't give us a clear delineation of what to do. Finally, if we think of our patient that I was considering ECMO for without end organ injury, but with a SAT of 85%, it's crucial to recognize that the SAO2, the SAT, does not equal the delivery of oxygen or the DO2. The DO2 is defined, of course, by the carrying capacity of blood for oxygen times cardiac output. How much oxygen is there times how much it goes round and round. Carrying capacity of oxygen has an equation, and the SAT is, of course, a core contributor to the carrying capacity of oxygen. But comparing the delivery and the SAD begs the question, which one is more important? Everybody, of course, throws a fit when the SAT goes below 90, but the one that's important is really the delivery of oxygen to tissue. And when you think about the delivery of oxygen to tissue, you have to think about the delivery of oxygen versus how much oxygen is being used by the tissue, the VO2, and whether that's equal throughout the body. Of course, my finger, if I'm critically ill, is probably not using a lot of oxygen, whereas maybe my intestines and heart and lungs are. And uh, when we think about the heart as an example, in illness, if you're young and healthy and quite vigorous, you might have a massive cardiac output or an inflammatory state that you, means that your heart is metabolizing and using up a lot of oxygen. And the DO2 through the body is similarly not equal. The DO2 typically auto-regulates as my heart demands more oxygen because of increased cardiac output, my coronaries dilate and the heart gets more oxygen. But in disease states like coronary artery disease or in severe stress states like septic shock and all these things, it's not always perfect. And so in general, the DO2 matters far, far more than the SO2, um, although the SAT is critically important to the delivery. But that doesn't apply in all patients, and so you can't unanimously say a SAT of 85 is fine because the SAT of 85% may not be delivering enough oxygen to the heart in a stressed heart or in a heart that has some coronary disease. So when you're unsure and the patient's hypoxic, there are a few things you want to look out for. The first is you look for signs of poor oxygen delivery. That's signs of end organ injury, evolving vasoplegia but not infected, evolving um, um, shock state, that isn't of clear etiology. 
You also want to look at what you're doing to the patient. Are we hurting the patient to get them to a SAT of 85%? And we also want to think about irreparable physiology when we're considering ECMO or advanced support for a patient that has a low SAT. Things I think about in a patient that's going towards ultra lung protective ventilation with tiny, tiny tidal volumes to get a small driving pressure is severe acidosis or that hypoxia 85-88% that's inducing an RV failure. And we know that RV failure, ARDS, is really problematic and associated with much more worse mortality. All right, back to our case. 30-year-old that's previously healthy and has severe ARDS. We've maximized the ventilation. We've done all the right things. He has a lot of cardiac output and his labs just have respiratory acidosis. Here, we can simply monitor him for a problematic delivery of oxygen, for iatrogenic vent injury, and for irreparable physiology related to this injury. Now, I would argue that this is not as good as it can be because driving pressure is 20, I think we can do better, maybe he needs more PEEP, or maybe he needs lower and lower tidal volumes, which are gonna result in worsening acidosis from respiratory acidosis. And that may result in a progressive acidosis um, that causes end organ injury. Uh, and if we keep pounding on the lung, that may result in evolving organ injury. Uh, so at the current moment, looking at this paper, I might drop, or this patient, I might drop the tidal volume a little more. But I'd be on the lookout for these things to consider. Again, always be thinking about why we ECMO. This case evolved, of course. Maximal ventilation, unchanged stuff, but suddenly the labs show evolving AKI, vasoplegia, some congestive hepatopathy, and the RV was dysfunctioning on echo, nitric didn't fix it, and I really couldn't fix the severe acidosis progressing. Here in this case, we have end organ dysfunction, we have ventilator injury, both on the short term this is going to cause a multi-organ system failure and on the long term might limit his ability to recover to be a healthy person. And of course, we have irreparable things happening. Worse uh, um, RV dysfunction due to acidosis, but with a maximized vent, so I'm not able to fix it. So we put him on ECMO. The easiest way to cannulate somebody for VV ECMO is from the femoral vein, and then we put the blood from the ECMO circuit back into the neck. This is the same drawing from the early slide where I review the basic anatomy of ECMO. And here we pick basic normal settings, normal RPM to get a flow of about four, a sweep was four, we used a sweep FiO2 of 100%, and his postmembrane sat, suggested that the ECMO circuit was working great. And in a typical situation, this would be really good, but he simply didn't get better. The sat stayed 85%, and the pre-membrane sat was oddly high. The problem here was recirculation. ECMO can recirculate. It's very unusual to have recirculation from the internal jugular in the neck down all the way to the femoral vein in the leg. But certainly you can occasionally get some blood that goes uh, down the vena cava and back to the ECMO circuit. And there's a very easy way to look for recirculation. You simply look at the color of the cannulas. Venous blood going to the ECMO circuit should be really dark, you know, blue blood. It looks very, very dark red, venous blood. And of course, the ECMO blood going out should be really oxygenated because it's ECMO blood, and so it should be bright red. When those are approximating each other and the color is red red, is very concerning for a circling around of this ECMO blood going round and round down the vena cava and leaving only blood, bad blood to go elsewhere. Let's try a different cannulation strategy. Instead of femoral IJ, one alternative in VV ECMO is to put in what's called an Avalon cannula. Now Avalon is a brand name and this cannula is essentially a really, really big central line that has two drawback ports where you pull blood from the SVC and the IVC and you bring that to the ECMO circuit, and you deliver blood back into the right atria, hopefully in line with your tricuspid valve where you're delivering blood in an efficient way that will go to the lungs. 
these candles are nice. It's one line, it's easier to place, and it's okay for mobilization. They can move around and walk occasionally. Although sometimes they suffer from positioning changes where if they twist 10 or 20 degrees off axis, they're suddenly not in line with that uh, exact right atrial entrance and the tricuspid valve and the flow will drop. And they occasionally recirculate. Although I can tell you that it happens much less frequently than I thought it would given that the cannula is you know, essentially one, uh, uh, one cannula, I thought recirculation would be a bigger problem. But smart physicists and medical developers made it in such a way that that happens much less frequently. So this Avalon cannula went in, we closed off that femoral vein cannula, and things did pretty okay. We had great flow at a normal RPM, and we had a sweep of five uh, matching the flow, with an FiO2 of 100%. We anticoagulated a little bit. Cannulas were dark red, bright red, suggesting no recirculation problem. And his vital signs were still this very high pulse, high MAP situation, and his SAT stayed low. Hemoglobin was eight, eight and a half or so, downtrended from uh, normal, but he's now two weeks in from critical illness. And other than a little pre-renal kidney injury from aggressive diuresis, things were stable. Wow. We have a DSAT on ECMO and it's not getting better. What's going on and how do we fix it? Persistent hypoxia is a common problem on VV ECMO and it's really related to a flow mismatch problem. We know that ECMO flow is to some degree limited by the cannula size and how much blood we pull out. And normally we're maxing that out in the four to five liter per minute range. And this is nice, good blood. But particularly in the case of a younger, healthier patient, their native blood flow might be 6 to 10 liters a minute. And if their lungs are truly not working, that blood doesn't get oxygenated by anything. And you essentially have a shunt where you have a mix of blood flow from ECMO being 5 liters in this situation and a mix of native flow that's skipping or bypassing the ECMO of about 5 liters. The total flow that's going to the body is really the mixture. And as the native cardiac output goes up, that ECMO flow is fixed. And so the mixing is going to not look as good and the SAT is going to go down. I'll ask again the question, which one matters, the oxygen saturation or the delivery of oxygen? Of course, the delivery of oxygen. And we know as the cardiac output goes up, the delivery of oxygen is going to go up. But we do have to be impeccably mindful that certain tissue beds may not be served well by this idea that a DSAT doesn't matter because their cardiac output's going up. And you have to think about end organ problems of poor delivery of oxygen or increased extraction ratio in tissue beds like the heart and whether that saturation is enough for that patient. And let's pretend you shoot a goal of trying to fix this or that you have, say, a slowly rising troponin and you think it might be related to this persistent hypoxia and a maximal extraction ratio and a, a flow-dependent hypoxia in certain areas of the body. We the way to think through persistent hypoxia on ECMO is to try to fix the good blood, the ECMO blood, by doing things like adjusting the flow through the ECMO, maxing it out, increasing the sweep and FiO2, again the sweep being more a CO2 thing, and the FiO2 fixing the oxygen. And then beyond that, we want to fix the bad blood by fixing the lungs as much as we can so that they at least contribute to this equation. More P, maybe more FiO2 than the total lung press. And doing other good things like diuresing, antibiotics, things like that. And then we want to fix the shunting blood, the SCVO2, the venous blood that is going through the lungs and having nothing done to it. If we can fix that, the mixed blood is going to have more oxygen as well. And we do that by decreasing how much oxygen you use throughout the body by sedating you, giving good pain relief, occasionally paralyzing people. We certainly avoid fever, which can increase your metabolic rate and drop the oxygen returning to the heart. And finally, you can increase the total carrying capacity of oxygen in the blood by transfusing. And that will mean that there's more oxygen going round and round. And therefore, whatever the body uses, 
uh, it has extra to pull from and the venous blood returning will have some extra oxygen uh, to, uh, to go around. And finally, something we don't do very frequently uh, in, a, in a real medical way is to fix the flow mismatch. We do want to decrease the cardiac output if it's exceedingly high by treating the inflammatory state. And there's a very rare patient that may benefit from the use of esmolol, which will increase your SVO, CVO2 and also decrease your cardiac output. But you have to approach this with exceeding caution because in a patient that has RV dysfunction, you can harm them with this. And you have to remember what you're treating. Is it really the 85% saturation that's causing a problem or is that just making us all feel like we're nervous and it should be higher than that. That's case one. Case two was a phone call I got at 6.30 in the morning from the cardiologist. And we had a patient who was 70 years old and they had congestive heart failure and shock. They were sent from a referring institution um, and uh, at that hospital had gone to a cath lab for an MI, had been stented, and the function of the heart was so poor they needed a temporary LVAD. They used an Impella two and a half device put on the left side of the heart. And in the referring hospital ICU, the patient had persistent hypoxia, and so the patient was put on VV ECMO with this device called a Protect Duo. And by device, I mean cannula. So they had a Protect Duo cannula in, they were doing VV ECMO. And when they got to our unit at our hospital, the patient was very hypotensive and the LVAD was alarming for suctioning events. And again, VADs are a bigger talk than anything I want to go through today, but a suctioning LVAD means the VAD was empty and it had no preload and it shakes similar to chugging on the ECMO. The team had administered fluids and it didn't help and the hemoglobin certainly didn't suggest they were bleeding. And so it wasn't clear why the LVAD was suctioning because the patient had enough fluid on board. And so the team turned down the ECMO circuit and called me. And, uh, and what they'd done is turned down the RPM. So the flow on the ECMO had gone from three to one and a half. Things got a lot worse. We were near arrest and they gave me a buzz. Protect Duo is a really crucial anatomy uh, um, based, has a very crucial anatomy based difference than other VV ECMO types. Protect Duo is the brand name of a cannula for VV ECMO that is essentially a SWAN or pulmonary artery catheter, or if you're a cardiologist, a right-sided impella more or less. And this is a cannula that goes through the heart and it draws blood from the right atrium, but the distal port or the distal cannula keeps going out and out into the pulmonary artery. And this cannula sets the ECMO circuit up where it pulls out from the atria to the ECMO circuit and then delivers blood out the PA past the competent pulmonary artery. And the blood thus bypasses the RV, which becomes offloaded and is pumped into the PA even if there's pulmonary hypertension. So this is really an RVAD with an oxygenator. It's good for ambulation, has stable positioning and overall pretty good flows. It's a little more challenging to place, of course, and weaning becomes more complex because as you wean the ECMO, the RV is going to have to deal with more blood getting to it because the ECMO will not be offloading it anymore. And you can't be quite sure what the pulmonary pressures are. And so the RV is gonna to have to deal with more fluid and it's also gonna to have to deal potentially with a little higher CO2 and maybe a little lower oxygen in the face of maybe elevated pulmonary hypertension. All those things make it complex, but it's a great device otherwise. And in this situation where we had a patient that was having suction events with a VAD on the left side, the problem was quite simple. The patient needed the RVAD function of the VV ECMO through the Protect Duo cannula. They had RV failure. And so when you turn the Protect Duo down, the RV was not pumping blood across. And so the LV, even with enough fluid on board, was empty. In other words, the body had enough fluid on board, but the 
fluid was getting to the RV and just stagnating and not making its way across the lungs into the left side so the vat could pump it out. And so in this situation, we just turned up the Protec Duo ECMO circuits RPM and flow and the LVAD suctioning improved. Now, once we got that fixed, we had to ventilate them. And ventilation on ECMO is a big topic, of course, and it's not really well studied in the sense that there's no big trials to guide what we do. But you do want to think about why we ECMO. One of the reasons why we ECMO is to provide lung rest. If we offer a lot of lung rest by using the ECMO maximally and turning the ventilation down to much less ventilation, we may decrease how much lung injury we occur, which on the acute side will likely decrease the inflammatory mediators that happen when you stretch and injure the lung repeatedly with the ventilator. I'm hopeful that this would improve long-term outcomes by uh, helping decrease how much scarring happens to the lung. And certainly, if you're not pounding on the, on the lung with very high pressures, you may decrease the afterload on the right ventricle. So the goals when you're ventilating a patient on ECMO is to prevent lung necrosis by not using the lung at all, you prevent refractory atelectasis with a good amount of PEEP, and you keep the lung moving to some degree. You want to prevent resorption atelectasis from hyperoxia, and you want to prevent hyperoxia-induced lung injury. And finally, you want to be protective with your ventilator with low plateau pressures and adequate PEEP. The main ELSO guideline group for ECMO management suggests running patients at uh, um, overall plateau of in that 25 to 30 range with typical settings of PIP of 25 over a PEEP of 15 with a reverse I to E ratio and a very low respiratory rate to start. And then they suggest after the patient's had at least some recovery that you flip to 20 over 10 with an uh, um, inspiratory to expiratory ratio of one to two and respiratory rate allowing for spontaneous ventilation as well. Our next case is a young man that had a strong family history of acute coronary death and cardiac disease who arrested at home. His mom was an emergency medical technician and she did CPR and saved his life. And the cath lab also saved his life by putting in a stent very quickly. However, after the patient was stented, he had severe hypoxia, probably related to CPR-induced pulmonary um, contusion and flash pulmonary edema from low cardiac output from his STEMI. Cardiology shot me a page to fix the ventilator, and I couldn't do it. And then I heard the fateful words, we'll just go on VA ECMO. So I'll give a moment and ask you what the most important question is in this situation. We're considering ECMO for hypoxia. Well, VA ECMO is typically used not for hypoxia, but for a failing heart. And you have to ask yourself how the heart function is when you're considering the use of VA ECMO in the setting of hypoxia or damaged lungs. Here's veno arterial ECMO drawn again. It's the same picture I drew early in the talk. We do veno arterial ECMO when the heart's not working. In general, we pull blood from a major central vein like the femoral vein shown here and the ECMO is using the pump more than the oxygenator and delivering blood into the aorta and that blood is going of course down the remainder of the femoral artery and also backwards up the aorta to the great vessels and the coronary vessels. This retrograde aortic flow has really two core consequences. The first is that if the heart is working okay it can start to fight the ECMO. So the resulting flow will have some blood in the aorta, particularly the proximal aorta, being pumped from the lungs to the left side of the heart, out the LV and towards the distal aorta, and some blood that's going retrograde from the ECMO up the aorta. This mixing point has some consequences. 
the proximal vessels, as you get closer to the heart, of course, are going to get more blood from the heart itself. And so in the case that the lungs are sick, this heart blood, or blood from the heart, are getting, uh, uh, this heart blood is going to be blood delivered from the lungs. And if the lungs are sick, this blood is not going to be impeccably oxygenated. And you can get a resulting differential oxygenation. This has different terms. One of them is Harlequin syndrome, another is North-South syndrome. And this is the reason why we measure the blood gases in a patient on VA ECMO from the right arm, because the right arm is going to be the proximal site of arterial blood, as close to the heart as we can measure within reason. North-South syndrome is where you have really sick lungs that are putting out blue blood and a heart that's not working but is working well enough to fight the ECMO circuit and this mixing point of blood, blue blood from the heart, hits the ECMO blood distal to really where you want it to be. And those first vessels that come off the heart are the coronaries and of course the innominate artery which pumps out to your right arm and to your head. When this occurs, there's several approaches to take. Right away, you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to fix the lungs. Optimizing ventilation with PEEP and FiO2, giving antibiotics and diuresing if those things are indicated. And we also want to do similar things to what we do to a patient that has persistent hypoxia on VV ECMO. And we want to fix the venous blood so that the lung has to do less work to deliver oxygenated blood to the left side of the heart. We sedate, provide good pain relief, paralyze when it's indicated, and do targeted temperature management by avoiding fever. Occasionally, we'll transfuse, although transfusion goals are an evolving state. In the case of a north-south syndrome, you may escalate a transfusion goal from uh, seven or eight at the low end of what is deemed acceptable in ECMO to maybe nine or even 10 in the occasional rare situation. We don't do esmolol in this situation, although it could work. And finally, you have to think about um, decreasing the native cardiac output by doing things like increasing the ECMO flow, which will pull more venous blood, thus decreasing preload to the heart, and increasing the afterload to the uh, left side of the heart, which would decrease the native flow and let the heart rest a little bit on ECMO. And finally, you'd think about changing your support. If the heart is working well enough to fight the ECMO, maybe you don't need VA ECMO and VV ECMO is indicated. Alternatively, if the heart's working just well enough to fight ECMO, but not well enough to stay alive or function adequately, you may do something like VAV ECMO, which I'll show the anatomy of on the next slide. VAV ECMO is where you pull blood from the uh, veins, the major vessels. So here is shown as pulling blood from the femoral vein. And then you run it through the ECMO circuit, and your delivery of blood from the ECMO circuit goes both to the heart, but you Y in a cannula so that some of that blood is going back to the venous circulation, typically through the neck. And you can do this so that you deliver blood that's better oxygenated to the lungs, so they have to do less work and you allow the heart to do some of its own work so that mixing point fights you less. This is called VAV ECMO, and it's one option in the setting of North-South Syndrome. Okay, there are other ways we cannulate people and other things that result as a consequence of how we cannulate people. We've talked a little bit about FemFem VA ECMO resulting in that retrograde aortic flow, and we talked endlessly about the North-South syndrome and the mixing point when the lungs are sick and the heart's not working. But FemFem VA ECMO with retrograde flow can increase the afterload on the heart, and this is really relevant uh, more based on what we see when we order an echo of the patient than it is physiologically most of the time. Of course, retrograde flow up the aorta from a pressurized ECMO circuit is going to worsen uh, demand a bit. That's typically 
offset by the decreased preload delivered to the heart, and it will certainly hinder the native LV output. Um, and there's less preload there. And so in this situation, any echo you get for a patient on VA ECMO is going to be an empty LV with afterload, um, an empty LV that is facing elevated afterload. And in the case of an already compromised LV, this will make your echo look worse than it should. And you gotta remember that when you are ordering echoes on these people. But occasionally this gets worse and your ECMO circuit adds enough back pressure to the LV that the LV will dilate. This is certainly apparent when you have aortic insufficiency and there's a not competent valve and you're pumping ECMO blood uh, in, a, uh, in a constant way, not dependent on systole or diastole, but at the constant RPM of the ECMO circuit, which makes any aortic insufficiency likely to get dramatically worse with ECMO and blow up the LV. And this can be quite severe and distort the septum uh, pushing on the RV, it of course will back up to the lungs and uh, and dilate the left side of the heart and worsen the RV perfusion pressure. There's limited work uh, assessing how to strategically fix this or the best route to fix this. The two generic approaches are to use a drainage cannula that you drain to the ECMO circuit and uh, these drainage cannulas are just lines you put in from the femoral uh, artery and you float them into the left ventricle and then you drain them again passively to the ECMO circuit outside of the body. Or you can put in a percutaneous temporary valve like an impella across the aortic valve and use that not as a VAD that has heart function but run it at a low enough rate that you're simply preventing LV dilation uh, and encouraging forward flow across your aortic valve. You can cannulate centrally. This is of course done in the operating rooms and this is done at the proximal aorta where you're delivering blood and pulling blood from the right atria. The chest stays open in these and you need deep sedation and or paralysis to maintain them safely, uh, but it avoids many of the other problems like north-south syndrome or flow restrictions on the lumen size because you're cannulating in such large areas you can use even bigger cannulas. There are other cannula options. I've talked about VA and VV and uh, um, VAV ECMO. Uh, but you can do lots of things and to find your way around these listings you just need to google the type of ECMO you're doing and anytime you have ECMO draw the anatomy out which is really crucial to understanding the problems that can occur. I'm not going to do big time addressing of bleeding and clotting and weaning of ECMO and I'm already avoiding the bigger topic of how we adjust and manipulate um, ECMO for hypoxia or for CO2 clearance and specific issues because this is an introductory lecture. I do want everyone to be aware that the ELSO is a wonderful reference for questions that come up on call at night and the Red Book is a fairly cheap book for how much material it contains and it is a textbook level management strategy uh, um, and background piece for ECMO management. On ECMO, the biggest risk to the patient is bleeding or clotting, and they have a true bleeding diathesis, as in they are prone both to bleeding and to clotting problems. These are iatrogenic, um, as in we use heparin or we don't use heparin in at-risk patients, and they're also related to many of the plastics of the circuit and the lack of pulsatile flow. All patients on ECMO will develop a von Willebrand factor deficiency and platelet defects. Um, and have this nonspecific inflammatory state. They all have big lines going out of their body that were typically placed emergently, and so they're at risk of line sepsis and other infections. And if you give them heparin, they are at risk of HIT. We have an anticoagulation protocol here. There are none that are accepted in the literature as the gold standard. This happens to be one option where we bolus heparin after initiation of ECMO, and then we monitor with anti 10 As towards either a standard or a high risk goal at more or less set rates of heparin, adjusting accordingly. And if we have trouble with how much heparin we're needing, we check for AT3 deficiency. 
and we check for AT3 deficiency in a lot of people anyway, both day one and every three days after, and we replenish if you need to, or alternatively, based on costs and direct patient risks and things of that nature, you could consider things like DTIs, like the volarudin. In general, goals are evolving and individualized per patient. Hemoglobin goals have been 12 and 14 as recently as 10, 15 years ago, and have slowly downtrended, just like hemoglobin goals in every other area of the hospital for the 7 to 10 range now. In general, most people that I talk to shoot for somewhere in that 7.5 to 8.5 range, as long as there's not refractory hypoxia. We use a lot more TAG and ROTEM assessments of bleeding, and that helps us identify for brunelisis and other struggles um, on ECMO. We transfuse more frequently. We use TXA occasionally, and we even use Nova 7 every once in a while for patients with refractory hemorrhage on ECMO. These are things that you should be semi-aware of, and I've linked to the ELSO guideline on the bottom on anticoagulation on ECMO. That's all I had for today. Thank you for your time and listening, and I hope that helped make ECMO a little bit easier for you to understand.